Now, Henry VI's queen, Margaret, was determined that her son, not York, would succeed to Henry VI. She wants York dead, but he is in control of the country. Now, in 1456, Henry VI recovers again. Margaret starts to raise an army in Wales. But Henry VI keeps York as his chief counsellor and leaves him in charge of the war against Scotland. The merchants in London are unhappy at the at French piracy in the English Channel and the loss of trade. The north of England is in disorder as rival noble families fight for power, in particular the Percys are fighting the Nevilles again. Uh, York's ally, Warwick, starts to build a power base in Calais. Now, Warwick is in control of the last English army in France, the garrison of Calais. It's an important and powerful post. Now, Margaret starts to raise an army in the Midlands and also introduces conscription for the first time in English history. In 1458, the Archbishop of Canterbury, watching the slowly rising tension as both sides start to grab control of military forces, attempts a reconciliation, what he calls a love day, in which Yorkists and Lancastrians are made to walk hand in hand to St Paul's, but it achieves nothing. In 1459, Warwick, who's the ally of York, is summoned to London to explain his actions on and his activities against Spanish and German shipping, and he particularly is accused of piracy himself. He's, he's in charge of a lot of the English fleet to try and deal with French pirates, but he's accused of being a pirate himself. York and Salisbury are summoned too to explain their behaviour. They both fear for their lives and with Warwick they go into rebellion. And so York, Salisbury and Warwick all rebel against the crown after they are summoned to London to explain their behaviour. And in fairness if they had gone they would almost certainly have been killed. And so the war begins in earnest. Now York summons his supporters to Ludlow and Warwick is asked to go and join him with the, Calais, with the Calais garrison. Salisbury's forces fight a Lancastrian army at the Battle of Bloor Heath and then manages to link up with York's forces. But his army has been devastated by the fighting at Bloor Heath. Casualties on both sides have been incredibly high. The Yorkist army faces the Royal Army near Worcester at a place called Ludford Bridge. The Yorkist army, having suffered such casualties at Bloor Heath, is heavily outnumbered and a lot of the soldiers look at it and they don't fancy their chances and the Yorkist army just melts away faced with this large royal army. York flees to Ireland whereas Warwick tries to escape back to Calais with Salisbury. Now Henry VI is back in total control and he sends Somerset to try and drive Warwick out of Calais. However, he is rapidly beaten off by Warwick, who proves himself to be a fine commander of both ships and men. The Yorkist camp is now declared to be traitors to the crown. Now, Warwick, proves, proving himself to be an incredibly able naval commander, manages to win control of the seas around England, and he links up with the Yorkists in Dublin. And so Ireland and Calais is pretty much under control of the Yorkists, but England is under control of the Lancastrians of Henry VI. Warwick and Salisbury then land in Kent with the backing of, of all people, the Pope. They gain wide support also from London. On the 10th of July 1460, there's the Battle of Northampton. The Royal Army is defeated and Henry VI is captured after having yet another mental breakdown. York returns, and by the time he reaches Abingdon, it's clear that now he wants to be king. He's not going to be satisfied with being protector or regent. Now, as far as he's concerned, he's going to be king. He enters London, he assembles Parliament, and makes straight for to sit on the throne to shocked silence. A critical moment has now been reached. Henry VI would, it's agreed, remain king, but York would be his heir and his protector. There is the Act of Accord signed, where both sides would agree that Henry VI will remain on the throne, but when he dies, York will take his place.
but Margaret won't accept this. Margaret flees to Wales and gains support of the Scottish king. York marches north to try and apprehend her and attacks her forces at Wakefield, even though his own army is heavily outnumbered. Margaret's army is much larger than that of York and it's a complete Lancastrian victory. York himself is killed. His 17-year-old son is captured, as was Salisbury. Both are rapidly executed. Margaret, a bloodthirsty woman if ever there was one, decides to put the head of York over the gates of the city of York, wearing a paper crown to mock his claim to be king of England. York's other son, his eldest son, the 18-year-old Edward, now takes on the Yorkist claim and attacks the Lancastrian army that was led by Jasper Tudor, beating them at the Battle of Mortimer's Cross. After he sees a vic uh, he claims that they stay away, seeing a claims to see in a vision of the three sons, the three surviving sons of York, and after that he adopts the Sun in Splendour device as a, his own. Margaret's army moves south to try and capture and defeat this new young York. She is broke and can't afford to pay her own army, and so the Lancastrian army loots England as it goes to try and fight this new Yorkist army. Warwick himself, still at large, gathers support and then rushes to go and help the Yorkist force at the Second Battle of St Albans. Now, as it happens, he's beaten, but he lives and he escapes again. Margaret manages to free Henry VI, who she finds sitting quietly under a tree. He's still in his catatonic state. He'd been kept alive. You might say, why not kill him? Because if you kill him, his claim will go to his son, who at least isn't staring into space. And so if you're going to fight a war with anybody, you want someone who's locked up into a catatonic state, just staring into space. So he'd been kept alive. Margaret now, after the Second Battle of St Albans, frees Henry VI. As the Lancastrians uh, loot the south, London closes its gates to them. Margaret hesitates before the gates of London and withdraws north. Edward of York meets up with the beaten forces of Warwick and then gathers forces from London and chases Margaret back up north. And he, at this point, declares himself to be king, King Edward IV. They meet at the Battle of Towton in Yorkshire, in what, what will be one of the bloodiest battles ever fought by, in this time period, indeed the bloodiest on English soil. Now, both sides agree, before the Battle of Towton, that whoever wins at Towton, this will be the end of it. It's the largest battle, but the historians disagree on just how big Towton was. They say that there was between 40 and 80,000 men fighting at Towton. Possibly around 28,000 men die. The greatest loss of life ever on English, but not British soil. York smashes Henry VI's army and then advances to the city of York, where he removes his father's head from its spike with its paper crown. Henry VI lives, but is captured by the Yorkists. Margaret and her son flee abroad after the devastating defeat at Towton. Now, as for Henry VI, it is time to think about, really, as it were, what he'd been like as a king. His subjects had come to admire his unworldliness and did not wish to see him necessarily deposed. He was seen as a saintly man who was very different or rather seemed completely, uh, uh, um, completely um, uncaring of power. But this made it very difficult for his subjects to deal with. York was hesitant to advance his claim before 1460, which reveals the deep roots the Lancastrians had put down onto the throne. The Lancastrians, however, came near to victory in 1461. But in Edward IV, the Yorkists had found a decisive leader and a gifted general. And in Warwick, the Yorkists had a man who could use naval power to give them a decisive military edge. <laughs>